Feel free to check out my tea public after the video and support me on Patreon. Watch till the end of the video for more. <laughs> Special thanks to Scry Productions for the epic remaster of the King Kong vs. Godzilla theme. If you want to check out more of his music, then subscribe to Scry Productions on YouTube or Patreon. And another special thanks to Patreon supporter GamesGalore13 for commissioning this video. To become a patron, click the link in the description. Well, I've already talked about movies that try to cash in on Dino De Laurentiis' King Kong remake, namely Ape and The Mighty Peking Man, so it's about time that I actually get to talk about these films for once. As we all know, the original King Kong is one of the major cornerstones in the evolution of filmmaking. Being one of the most important movies of all time, being such an ambitious feat on both a storytelling and technological standpoint, and with a movie as recognizable and powerful as the original King Kong, who on earth would even think to remake such a beloved classic? It's like trying to remake Ghostbusters. Oh, um, uh, okay, it's like trying to remake Robocop. Total Recall, Lord of the Rings, Back to the- Are you f***ing kidding? Okay, okay, jokes aside, remakes, when done right, don't really try to erase the original from existence, even if they end up doing it by accident, but, you know. Normally, remakes tend to respect the original. Take Shin Godzilla, for example. While not exactly a remake, but more of a retelling, it's very respectful to the original film, while also putting a very unique modern spin on its premise. Remakes can especially be good when they bring new life into something that may seem outdated by today's standards, like Nosferatu, a beloved classic in the horror genre, and when it was remade in 1979 starring Klaus Kinski, there was a new layer of fear and dread added in that wasn't quite there before. And of course, because it's somewhat relevant to the subject of this video, the remake of True Grit is an example that some stories are just absolutely timeless and are adaptable through time. After all, there is a reason why Hammer's remakes of classic horror movies are so acclaimed by critics and audiences. So in Kong's case, why not remake it? I mean, admittedly, the methods of special effects then do seem a bit outdated by today's industry standards. I'll never forget the time one of my film professors showed a clip of the original King Kong and everyone was laughing at how it looked. God, why am I so insecure? If anything, a remake of King Kong seems like a good idea, as it means to show how film has evolved over time through the use of such a classic story that helped push its limits. In 1974, ABC executive Michael Eisner had the idea to remake King Kong. He pitched the idea to Universal and Paramount only for Dino De Laurentiis to nab the film rights to King Kong from RKO after figuring out that convoluted mess of red tape surrounding the iconic ape. <laughs> See what I did there? Red tape. Ape. De Laurentiis would hire Lorenzo Semple Jr. of Batman and the Green Hornet fame to provide a screenplay, with John Gillerman of The Towering Inferno to direct. Funny enough, Universal actually tried to sue De Laurentiis and RKO for trying to remake King Kong. But then RKO hit him with a reverse Uno card because Universal actually didn't own the rights to King Kong. It's like when Sony tried to claim my Rebirth of Mothra 2 review. Lorenzo would claim that this version of King Kong wouldn't dare to try and replace the original, but rather be its own thing while respecting what came before it. Kind of like how New Getter Robo, Shin Mazinger Z, and the live action Attack on Titan movies followed similar beats from the respective original manga while also putting their own unique spin on it. Or, for a more appropriate example, John Carpenter's The Thing, where it's essentially the same plot, just in a different coat of paint, while also acknowledging the existence of the original. But how does this remake of such a beloved classic fare? Let's take a look. Instead of the plot revolving around a movie that's being shot, it's centered around an oil company whose vessel is boarded by what appears to be a Big Lebowski. This is paleontologist Jack Prescott, played by the legendary Jeff Bridges, my spirit animal. And he eavesdrops into one of their meetings about a mysterious island filled with untapped oil. The island, of course, being Skull Island. As he would then tell everyone about the legend of Kong. 
Along the way, the crew finds a raft in the middle of nowhere carrying an aspiring actress named Duan, played by Jessica Lange. As the film progresses, Dude and Duan grow more attached to one another, as the film would continue to follow similar beats from the original. Crew goes to the island, crew confronts natives, crew goes back to their ship, natives kidnap the lead lady for Kong, the crew goes to get her back, crew incapacitates Kong, take him to New York, you know the drill. While the status of this remake may not be as iconic as the original, you'd be wrong to assume that it's not a solid film on its own. The characters and acting performances are all very good and bring so much charm to the film, especially the leads Jeff Bridges and Jessica Lange, but the crewmates are all surprisingly more memorable than the original, for me at least. They even got famous voice actor Peter Cullen, who'd go on to voice Optimus Prime and the Predator to do some voice work for Kong. But unfortunately, doing the voice for Kong proved to be too excruciating for Cullen to the point where he started coughing blood, which explains why the roar you mainly hear throughout the film is a modified dinosaur roar from the 1960s adaptation of The Lost World. Huh, I guess life really does, uh, find a way. Also, I think the cinematography here is pretty incredible, despite some wonky effect shots. I especially love the POV shots from Kong before the big reveal, and the scoring by John Barry also gives the movie this great sense of scale and wonder that's on par with the originals. I will say this though, I really wish Skull Island had a similar level of atmosphere as the original film. Yeah, it's very eerie, but it's nowhere near as magical as it was in 1933. It more or less feels like your standard jungle setting with strange creatures, which you don't really see much of either. But perhaps the biggest thing this film has going for it would be the ambitious special effects for the time. Following in the same footsteps as its predecessor by pushing the boundaries of filmmaking Making. Keep in mind, this was a year before Star Wars. They went as far as to utilize life-sized props for Kong, including a giant mechanical hand that just looks terrific, and even a one-to-one -one animatron that doesn't look that great in motion, but props for trying, and unlike the original, Kong would be portrayed through suitmation in that good old tokusatsu style. The man in the suit in question was the legendary Rick Baker, whose prior work included The Exorcist and would even go on to be an effects assistant on Star Wars, do makeup for an American werewolf in London, direct the effects in Videodrome, he'd even work on the remakes for Mighty Joe Young and Planet of the Apes, as well as the other King Kong remake we'll get to in the next video. He was even in Click, which was the very first movie I ever cried to in my life, Norbit, Tropic Thunder, Tron Legacy, which also had Jeff Bridges and is one of the greatest movies to come out in the 2010s if not ever, I'll fight anyone in the comments who disagrees. Rick Baker is a goddamn legend. Oh, uh, sorry about that, I got a little, a little carried away there. Moving on. Overall, King Kong from 1976, no matter how you look at it, is a classic. Obviously not in the same way as the original 1933 version, but it's a very respectful remake that I highly recommend checking out. And another thing worth noting is that a Blu-ray release from Shout Factory is coming out in May, and it's going to include the extended TV cut in HD. For a while, the only way to actually see this version was to raise low quality recording online. This extended TV cut of this King Kong remake was made for NBC as a two-parter event in which they basically added another 48 minutes. Mainly, this version has longer scenes and more effect shots, nothing too new is added necessarily from a storytelling and character standpoint, and it also trimmed down some of the violence because, you know, television. But hey, I'm honestly pretty hyped to see this version finally get an official release on Blu-ray in HD no less. But while the film would receive mixed reviews, King Kong from 1976 would be a huge commercial success, and would get nominated for three Academy Awards. In 1977, De Laurentiis was interested in doing a sequel to his King Kong remake, but even though the movie was considered a commercial success, it wasn't enough to meet their expectations to necessarily warrant something like that. 
Plus, they probably didn't want to have to deal with all the legal red tape that surrounds this iconic ape for some ungodly reason again. And according to writer Steve Pressfield, they considered having King Kong in Russia and King Kong in space. King Kong in space. How or why have we not gotten this yet? The writers would then stick with the idea that ever since the end of the 1976 film, Kong has been on life support for a good number of years after, well, you know, getting brutally shot up by Gatling guns from helicopters. De Laurentiis even found this idea to be a bit of a stretch. I mean, can you blame him? After a flashback of the previous film's climax, we cut to a decade later where Dr. Amy Franklin, played by Linda Hamilton of The Terminator, concludes that if Kong were to stay alive, he'd need to have heart surgery as well as a blood transfusion from another member of his species, which is endangered. Then by sheer coincidence, another member of Kong's species appears. However, it's a female, which could very likely complicate things and put Kong at even more risk. They take away the Lady Kong from her habitat and continue with the mechanical heart surgery and blood transfusion. Both Kongs escape and grow attached to one another. These moments are actually kind of nice, especially since it's Kong interacting with someone who isn't human. He has a lady he can chill with for once. Franklin and an adventurer named Bitch, uh, oh, uh, I mean Mitch, played by Brian Kerwin, get the idea to fund a preserve for the two creatures before the military comes in and separates them leaving Kong on a mission to get her back, building up to an absolutely incredible finale. Man, you really don't want to mess with Kong. There is also a scene where he brutally murders a couple of hunters who were antagonizing him. Jesus! And yeah, this movie is a bit of a downgrade compared to its predecessor. The characters are kind of forgettable and the directing as well as the writing is just odd. Although to throw in my two cents to the whole why bring Kong back to life in the first place debate, they do heavily play on the fact that Kong is from an endangered species of primates, so it would make sense for them to want to keep him alive. The effects are also not the greatest, but where they really shine are in the climax, with the use of miniature vehicles, pyrotechnics, and even the Kong suit looks imposing in some shots. All in all, King Kong Lives isn't really a bad movie. If it weren't for how good the effects can be, the epic finale, and the star power of Linda Hamilton, it probably wouldn't be as remembered as it is now and likely would have faded into obscurity. But unfortunately, as time went on, the ice that Dino De Laurentiis' company was on would only grow thinner, and with failure after failure, which included King Kong Lives, the company would eventually file for bankruptcy. But you know, even though these films aren't really discussed as much, I say they're still very important to mention when it comes to the history of Kong over the years and how he's adapted over time. On one hand, you can't really recapture lightning in a bottle, but considering how groundbreaking the original King Kong from 1933 was on a technical standpoint, it's only poetic that filmmakers would keep the tradition alive by showing the capabilities of numerous filmmaking techniques and how the art has evolved over time through the use of retelling a classic story. And that is something we'll talk more about next time. And on that note, thank you for watching. If you like what you see, then definitely consider supporting me on Patreon, where for a single dollar, your name can appear at the end of every future upload. Other than that, you can also get early access to videos, exclusive content, commission video requests, and receive a t-shirt of your choice from my tea public, like these Team Kong and Team Godzilla t-shirts that I promoted at the beginning of this video. Once I reach enough patrons, I'll review Keitama Mia's famous Garo series, so if that's something you'd like to see, then go support me on Patreon. Feel free to like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and this is Titan Goji, signing off. Also, Baby Kong is nowhere near as terrifying as Baby Kamen Rider, and I am happy to see that.